The last couple of years, I've had the pleasure to host an online trombone event, and that's called Jazz Trombone Bootcamp. And uh, we're going to be back with Jazz Trombone Bootcamp uh, for 2022. And I've got two of the uh, guest artists lined up already. And uh, I'm excited to, I'm not going to announce those yet, but if you are on uh, YouTube or Facebook, you can see the links down below. Uh, you can grab those. You can go to the to the um, website to register for Jazz Trombone Bootcamp. It's going to be the week of June 13th, 2022. Uh, so that should be really a fun week. It's going to involve uh, myself. It's going to I've got two great t teaching assistants for the week, and that is um, Jack Courtright and DJ Rice, two of our master students from the University of North Texas. So I'm excited to be able to host them, have them as part of the week. Uh, and so every day we'll be talking through some warm up stuff, some trombone technique stuff. We'll be checking out a few um, artists during our lunch and listen session, listening to some music and uh, and then also having our great guest artists. Every day we'll have a guest artist coming in to speak with us, uh, with some great uh, partners, some great companies to partner with that'll also be involved. Uh, all that stuff is coming up in, in the announcements uh, that are coming, but uh, early bird pricing on the boot camp will end as soon as those announcements come up. So if you wanna get in on the camp, uh, the ground floor, then I highly recommend jumping on that now. Just from a boot camp, just go to nickfinzer.store and you can sign up for that. But yeah, I'm really excited about the um, Jazz Trombone Boot Camp, and I hope that you'll be able to join. To join It's for um, all ages, you know. Um, we had everything from college professors to adult adults that want to get back into playing that maybe haven't played in a while, and we had high school students and middle school students. It's a whole range. It's kind of a choose-your-own-adventure type situation. It's definitely going to be um, a working week you know it's not going to just sit around and chill we're going to be playing we're going to be practicing we're going to be talking learning things together i'm going to incorporate some uh like trading sessions so i'll send out some tunes to learn in advance so we can talk about that and uh do the, some trading i'm trying to just build on each year make each year better and better and better now you're going to tape your parts for the rehearsal tomorrow absolutely always tape your parts always tape your parts especially when you're reading you want to make it as easy as possible for your band or the musicians or the school ensemble or whatever it might be uh, to be able to read it without having too much trouble the clearer you can be in the way that you lay out your music the easier it is for other people to interpret your music so i highly 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 recommend that you uh, take the time to lay it out well and uh, definitely tape it in your practice now, what is one bad habit you've noticed you do constantly that you want to fix immediately? Something, a bad habit that I have in my practice is not staying focused on the task at hand and being complacent. Yeah, being complacent. I was just thinking about it last night. Just like, man, I haven't really dug into like something specific. It's always been like, oh, I need to prep for this. I need to prep for this. I need to prep for this you know, gig to gig to gig, project to project to project without um, like a bigger picture in mind. So that's something that I've been thinking about fixing, developing some like technical limitations on the instrument. Uh, maybe not limitations, but just like ceiling, you know, like pushing the ceiling higher. Because um, there's plenty of stuff that I just maybe brushed over or I haven't gotten better at since college, you know. Why do musicians think in the grand scheme of things that social media remains a tool for getting discovered because social media can kind of encompass a lot of things depends i suppose on your definition of it um, i mean the purpose to me to having an active social media account is indeed to develop an audience and where are there people that are looking for things to consume but on social media so that could mean many things that could be you know, long form content and podcasts, that could be long form videos, that could be um, short form TikToks or Instagram reels or uh, medium one minute Instagram videos. I mean, there is an audience to be found on social media. However, it does not take the place of real life and it does not take the place of networking with musicians, playing with musicians, playing gigs, uh, getting your music out there, playing in front of people and developing uh, what that looks like. I think that it's going to be 
a both and situation for the foreseeable future. I don't think it's just one one platform or one thing. And I don't necessarily think it's about quote unquote being discovered, but it is a platform for discovery. Uh, it's up to you to do something that's going to draw people's attention. And if you want to continue and do things that are just for attention, that's one way to do it. Or you can uh, take an approach where you're going to you know, share your music and document your journey. And then you may not get as many followers right away, but you will develop a relationship with an audience that um, is a little bit more long lasting, I think. And um, so things will continue to change, you know, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, you know, so, you know, YouTube has had longevity, you know, but we'll see about other platforms. Uh, and it depends on what you want to create and what connects with your audience. So you kind of have to test and see what happens. But I think the reason that musicians think that it, it's a place to be discovered is because they have discovered other musicians there. But it's, it's both, you know, you can't, you can't rely on one or the other, meaning real life or online. You got to do both. You have to get out there. You have to be in a place where you can actually interact with musicians and challenge your challenge yourself. What was the most unbelievable thing you learned that used more than enough mental thinking to create a new perspective on music? The things most recently that have had an effect on my perspective on music have had nothing to do with music but have more to do with um, just consumer behavior at large or just kind of like, okay, the things that I thought existed maybe don't exist, which has, has affected me more like a, an idea of something existing that was a powerful idea in terms of chasing a goal or some specific gig or something like that. And then realizing that perhaps that thing was not real. That, that I think that has uh, informed my Music, my musical thinking more than another. How do you conceptualize putting a story together for an album and how do you implement that into promoting the album or shows? The more projects that I release and the more things that I see through the label, I mean, uh, more things that I see that are successful or unsuccessful have to do with, the, with that story. And that story can be about the album itself and the music. It could be a through line. And I think that's a particular type of music that is most interesting to musicians, you know, telling like a musical story through, you know, themes and kind of in an operatic way, um, thinking about, or, or maybe not opera or like film music or something like that, telling the story with the music itself, uh, building characters and things like that. And I think that's kind of a nerdy thing, you know, it's interesting to musicians um, and kind of the technical side of it. But more importantly for an album or promoting a band or shows is the story that you tell about the music and how you relate to the music and how people can relate to the music. So whether or not it exists when you write the music is kind of irrelevant. When you have a collection of tunes, you have to answer the question like, why should anyone care? Like, why should anyone care about this collection of tunes? What is it about these tunes? Just because they're your favorite tunes doesn't really tell us a story of why. You know, what is it that only you can do with these pieces that make it unique? Otherwise, why should we, why should we care? You know, why? That's the question to ask and the question to answer to start developing um, that story. And so anyway, as we move forward with more and different records, you know, you try to think about those stories and what stories can be told. And sometimes the story is just about you, you know, and sometimes the story is about the music, sometimes it's both. Hey Nick, how do you hedge against losing your audience if a social media platform disappears? Uh, you get their email addresses and have a newsletter and you have a website that you control. And this is something I talk to our artists about all the time, is you have to have a corner of the internet that is your own because any of these things could disappear at any time. Um, but your website is yours. The information you collect from your fans is, you, is between you and them. And that's emails, if that's phone numbers, some people want to do text threads, some people want to do emails, whatever your audience is comfortable with, sharing with you, but that's your uh, relationship directly with your audience. So that's the thing you want to build up and protect, you know, is that direct relationship because these platforms will 100% change. Instagram will disappear at some point or, or morph more than it has or TikTok or whatever, you know, that's a guarantee that the, you know, that it, there will be something else. But um, if you have that contact info, that's how you hedge against it. 
And um, that's why you have a website, even though people say, oh, having a website isn't important. You can just have social media. Well, yeah, you can. But then when they disappear, you're, you realize how reliant you were on those platforms. Where or how did you learn what you know on piano? Uh, through necessity, mostly, but needing to. Um, I've always had a studio of students, even since college. And, you know, so it started with just learning to accompany them on a blues or something simple, rhythm changes, and then learning tunes, and then jazz piano class in college and in grad school and uh, then just wanting to be able to compose music so I would spend some time trying to get a little bit better at the piano uh, time and time again and so just focusing on that arranger's piano the functional piano not trying to be you know not trying to play gigs or anything like that um, but just having that baseline of piano skills super important I haven't met too many great trombone improvisers that don't have some amount of basic piano fluency to just you know get through some tunes play through some chord changes um, just play some harmonies roots thirds and sevenths you know f check out that voice leading and and just kind of go from there i appreciate everybody being here for a little quick q a this afternoon uh check out the jazz trombone boot camp i hope you can join if you want to hang out and talk about jazz trombone this summer june 13 through uh, 17 and also April 5th new book create connect repeat is coming um, can't wait to share so thanks for being here guys have a great week and we'll catch you all soon